The following presentation features spoilers for Alan Partridge, Alpha Papa, and several mentions of disgraced DJ Jimmy Savile. This is Diabolical, a comedy podcast where four long suffering friends dissect films' most dastardly schemes, then try to improve them. I'm your host, Gaz, and this week's movie is 2013's Alan Partridge, Alpha Papa. So, Peril Pals, stop staring lovingly at that tie and blazer badge combination pack. Stow your big plate safely for the next buffet style meal. And for the four in attendance and the hundreds of millions listening at home. Let's get diabolical! Season finale, yeah. Season finale, yeah. It's the season finale. <laughs> season finale, yeah. It's the season finale. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to this week's pod, which, yes, you heard correctly, is the season two finale. Joining me as ever are the panel of peril, who will compete at the show's close to see who can improve the villainous plan of the week the best, to earn points for our Season 2 leaderboard in the race for second place, as Craig has already accrued enough points to win the crown. And we will be treated to his new moniker for Season 3 at the episode's Ooh. close, I assume. Is that what we're doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and the dethroning... And shaming of Lord Manly Supreme. <laughs> Hopefully a naked walk through the streets of Japan. <laughs> Game of Thrones style. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. That would be a dream. Shame. ding a ling a Shame. 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 <laughs> but for now, if you would introduce yourselves and tell us what is your favourite Alan Partridge line from any medium. Ooh, tough one. I think I'd have to say... The best of the Beatles. <laughs> Craig here, that's my favourite Partridge line. <laughs> Hello, Adam here. My favourite Partridge line is when he's talking to the Farmers Union guy in season one. And he says, if you see a lovely field with a family having a picnic and there's a nice pond in it, you fill in the pond with concrete, you plough the family into the field and you blow up the tree and use the leaves to make a dress for your wife who's also your brother. <laughs> is that Chris Morris? Because that's such a Chris Morris line yes, as well. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> there was loads. Um, I, I've, I've got one from the Oast House recently, but I, I thought that one is the best one. It's a beauty. It's great. <laughs> For the very final time, this is Lord Manly Supreme. And my favourite Partridge line is actually the first time I ever saw him. It's from the day to day. And it's just his little head spinning over a football field. (laughs) Goal! (laughs) He's got a foot like a traction engine. And the little half smile at the end. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. Shit, did you see that? (laughs) And that is a goal. And my personal favourite Partridge line is from Steve Coogan's live show. The man who thinks he's it as he's making his entrance from the back of the theatre. And he just starts saying to some random person in the audience, I can't have a protracted conversation. I can't have a protracted conversation. I can't have a protracted conversation. And then the music that's playing him onto the stage stops and he goes, see, that's why I can't stop and have a protracted conversation. That show's great. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's a great show. That show was the first time we saw Simon Peck, right? I don't think he'd ever been in anything before that. Uh, Not that I'd seen anyway. Yeah, it could well be. Yeah. I thought my character would have big eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, since this is the season two finale, I have a short quiz based on the 20 episodes that have made up season Ooh, two. Nice. Shall we have a little yeah. quiz? I suppose. Seems like a thing to do. Okay. There's four questions. Uh. You need to say your name to buzz in because they're not multiple choice. Right. Oh, how are you going to know? There's a bit of a delay. <laughs> Whichever one he hears first. 
Yes. I'm just going to, as he starts reading out, I'm going to say my name. And hopefully it'll be at the right time. I'll close my eyes like Leek, <laughs> aiming for the uh, exhaust pipe. Just to counter Turner's strategy here, there should be a minus point. Lord Nally Supreme. If you buzz in without either an answer or with an incorrect Lord Nally Supreme. <laughs> right, you, you're down two points already. Shit. Buzzing in without an answer. Yeah, Lord Nally Supreme. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question number one. The first episode of season two heard us discussing the Goonies, but can you remember which member of the panel of peril took the victory? Craig. <laughs> Craig has buzzed in. No, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's a valid answer. It's the correct answer as far as I'm concerned. Adam. Lord Manny Supreme. <laughs> I've already said me. I believe it was Craig. You, sir, are correct. Oh! One point. <laughs> Craig, if you'd have just buzzed in with your name and then repeated your own name, you'd have won that. I thought about it. I thought about it. I remember his plan now. It was to do with um, gremlins. gremlins. Yeah, the shared universe. <laughs> I remember mine didn't win because it was a bit gross. Uh, it was a bit of a dubious start to the series, shall we say, because I think three of our plans involved either killing or mutilating or both children. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Question two. In episode six, when discussing the Christmas classic Home Alone, I revealed that Wet Bandit Harry was a helicopter pilot. But do you remember the backstory that I gave him for gaining his pilot's license? Lord Manly Supreme. Go Lord Manly Supreme. Did he learn in Nam? Yes. Oh my goodness. Go on. <laughs> Very well done. Very well done. That is the first thing that popped into my head, but then I thought, am I thinking of Die Hard? (laughs) (laughs) Just like Saigon. That was uh, Timmy Mallet, my plan in that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that was amazing. (laughs) Question three. We're well known for deploying music to break up segments, but can you tell me how many times Lord Manly Supreme submitted a song for his diabolical plan? Lord Manly Supreme. (sighs) Lord Manly Supreme got that. Two times, baby. Really? I had once written down. Oh, in ep- in season two? <laughs> yes. In season two once. <laughs> so it's been once in each season. Okay. What are we saying? Are we, give- are we giving that to Love <laughs> Supreme? No. I think we should... Dis- yeah, he's already... Well, he's- he was down three yeah. at the start, so let's just let him have... Let him yeah. him up to minus two. <laughs> he's losing his name today, so let's let's be kind to him. <laughs> no, let's rub salt in the wound, disqualify him from the competition. <laughs> <laughs> And the final question, because he's languishing in final place, who knows which film slash episode saw Adam's first victory of season two? God, I don't think even I know. Is it going to be this episode? Oh, sorry. Lord Manny Supreme? (laughs) Has he won any of them? Yes, I have. He has. Definitely won one. I went back and checked. (laughs) I thought it was a trick question. No, I think that he's great. Did you say Craig? Damn (laughs) I think that he's not only won one, he's also been joint winner of at least one other. Yeah. And I think that his first one was Fantastic Mr. Fox. Yeah. Oh, my Lord. Well done. Well done. Well done. I remembered, yeah. I was robbed in that one. I have been robbed in all of these episodes. So, <laughs> so Lord Manly Supreme takes victory in the quiz. As he should have done in the season. You might have been robbed, but you were robbed by... You know, the Scarlet Pimpernel, Robin Hood, one of the good robbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is the Scarlet Pimpernel good? I think so. Um, Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Grant played him in that series, <laughs> so he must have been a delightful rogue of some sort. <laughs> yeah. Alan Partridge, Alpha Papa, directed by Declan Lowney, was released in 2013 to positive reviews and made nearly $10 million worldwide against a $4 million budget. Steve Coogan's comedic masterstroke is a character that has worn many hats. Be it sports commentator on the day-to-day, inept chat show host on Knowing Me, Knowing You, travel tavern-dwelling local DJ in I'm Alan Partridge, or latterly returning late replacement for a disgraced magazine show host in this time. Partridge is eternal. His long-awaited film debut finds him still at North Norfolk Digital with sidekick Simon by his side, but with slightly better hair. Alpha Papa is a lovingly low-stakes pastiche of Hollywood action tropes starring our favourite feckless presenter. 
his trusty personal assistant, Lynn, and of course, Alan's traditional frenemy, Sir David of Cliftonshire. Played by the wonderful Cole Meany, DJ Pat Farrell sets the plot in motion by starting a hostage situation at the now Shape radio station following the termination of his contract. There's obviously only one man who can extricate the captive safely and bring the renegade DJ to justice, Alan Partridge. To be clear, Pat is the renegade DJ, not Alan, although some have described him as a renegade, and rightly so. But to reiterate, in this case, I am referring to Pat. (laughs) So then, fellas, what is the consensus on the film? I loved every minute of it. Like the League of Gentlemen apocalypse that we watched a a few episodes back, I think it ramps up the scale to earn its place on the big screen. Perhaps you could argue even more so. The plots of the siege and the kind of secondary plot of Partridge seeing it as a chance to boost his career keep you engaged all the way through. And there are just so many laugh out loud moments. I think, was it like 22 years? Steve Coogan's been doing Partridge before that. So he just inhabits the character. Every facial expression, every shrug is just judged to perfection. (laughs) But as good as he is, I don't think the film would have worked anywhere near as well if we didn't feel for Pat. And so Cole Meany's performance is so good that it kind of demands our sympathy. And that kind of ends up being the perfect foil for Coogan. Then you've got Lynn and Michael, who, you know, I wish we could have seen a bit more of Michael. But with those as well, you've got absolute magic. And uh, if you want my one line review, in case they, you know, they reissue it and they need it for a poster. (laughs) Absolutely. Ruddy hilarious. (laughs) Quite so. Adam? Well, as you all know, I'm probably the biggest Partridge fan here. Wow. (laughs) Uh, when this film was being announced i was obviously absolutely cock hoop and for any self-respecting partridge fan it just goes straight away from the opening sequence the opening credits when he's uh, lip-syncing to rochford you just think okay i can relax it's going to be good and it is for for large parts it is but then there's there's a few bits that sag in it a little bit but then there's still plenty of laughs in it and great little one-liners or asides or some of the physical comedy as well is is just brilliant. So, yeah, I, I, I love it, and I'm sure we're going to get into the more nitty-gritty as we progress. Where would you say it sags, just out of interest? Just around about the siege. He's sort of going in and out. Mm. I, I think at those points there that maybe they've rewritten the script or something, there's like yeah. two, possibly three points, I thought, They've rewritten the script there. It does feel really odd that he leaves twice, doesn't it? Yeah, and then they just go, oh, just write in that Pat says it's fine. (laughs) (laughs) But overall, I I still absolutely love the film. I've watched it quite a few times, and I've just found it on Blu-ray for like £1.65, so I bought that. (laughs) I'll be definitely watching it again in the next week or two for sure. Yeah, Good stuff. What say you, Craig? Uh, Well, I don't know if I'd agree that it was cinematic in the same way as League of Gentlemen's Apocalypse or or even the Parole Officer but I think it does in the glorious tradition of British cinema especially the conclusion on the pier it suddenly becomes quite (laughs) cinematic in a very British way Mm. but nevertheless it outshines what you would hope for from the greatest feature length I'm Alan Partridge episode in it so full of memorable moments. Like Turner mentioned, the Roachford miming sequence is just burned into my memory forever. <laughs> and yeah, I love it. I could have picked my favourite ever Partridge line from this mm. film. And I think yeah. you, all, you all know which one it is anyway, because I talk about it a lot. And I, I searched hard to find a gif of it. I had to make my own. <laughs> it's the bit when he is eating the eclair. And... So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can find that on Giphy now, thanks to Craig. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, there's, um, Partridge doesn't have some of the, the best lines in this. Some of the stuff that, that others come up with, like uh, Psychic Simon Lynn and stuff like that, is just gold as well. Yeah, the supporting cast in this is, is outstanding. Yeah. yeah. People fit into it, you know, like they've always been part of it, mm. but they also make it feel bigger. People like Sean Pertwee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah love him. The guy who plays the deadpan sergeant, his name's Dan Mersh. You know, he's got the beard. He's <laughs> fucking excellent. He's so good. <laughs> and the chief of police as well. I forget her name, but she's in, in Motherland. Uh, she's yes. Oh, yeah. And the guy from 
the neighbour from Saxondale. I love that guy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's a good, it's an underrated series that Saxondale. It's a bit. Oh, it's so yeah. good, it's yeah. so good. But it's just Coogan doing what he does best. I think he's um, really he's one of the best actors of our time, certainly from a British perspective. I think. Don't think anyone of his era has got the chops to do as many roles as he does. Mm. One thing I really love that is kind of like a, a lampoon of action cinema is that in the opening titles, you know, you get Studio Canal and everything, and then you get North Norfolk Digital one, and it's really yeah. moody music. <laughs> Took me by surprise that I'd forgotten that. Gaz? Uh, as for my own thoughts on the film, similar to uh, Craig's, and, and similar to my thoughts on The Simpsons, it, I, I do like it a lot. It's very, very funny. But for me, there's not enough to justify it being... A cinematic release could have been a two-part mm. special on Sky to go with Scissor Isle and Places <laughs> of My Life for me. I suppose that's part of the charm, really, isn't it? How low-key, low-budget, low-scale mm. it, it is. $4 million mm. was the budget, which uh, I think is probably less than Shaun of the Dead cost. Well, yeah. got to be. A very different film, of course, but yeah. still. Yeah, great great performances throughout. Steve Coogan's, um, it's his masterpiece, isn't it? Uh, partridge he's never he's never going to escape it nor no. nor should he try to it's uh, a character full of wonderful contradictions and highfalutin ideas above above his <laughs> iq level and uh his lot in life and it's it's great to laugh mostly at him but sometimes yeah. with him in any situation that he gets himself in and a hostage situation in this case i remember seeing it mooted years and years before that that was going to be the film and it doesn't disappoint. It is very, very funny putting him into that situation, mm. trying to be, trying to be the hero. So yeah, on, on the whole, I do really mm. enjoy it, and I'll watch it again definitely. But it's just to me, unlike the League of Gentlemen's Apocalypse, it doesn't justify being on the big screen visually. See, I had the same same problems with this as I did with League of Gentlemen. I just thought that both the series of Partridge and anything he does as a series of Partridge is, is get, he's got more time to write and produce good content. And the same with the legal gentleman as well. I just thought that the, again, the movie just was really great and had some fantastic bits through it like this, but then there was bits in it that were just very low. And, and I was just like, Oh, but this, it's not to say, I say I did enjoy them both, but I think this series of both are better. Hmm. No, you mean the the closest thing that I compared it to in my mind was the Pauline Calf Fat Bob wedding <laughs> feature length special that they did for Paul Calf, yeah. which I thought was absolutely insanely good for you know a TV movie. <laughs> that kind of at the time, that's what British cinema was like. So I was really impressed with that, and I think Alpha Papa being produced so much later. It was kind of in line with, you know, similar low budget British cinema at the time, but yeah, you know, mm. it's just not quite as cinematic, but it's still still fantastic. The thing that I appreciate about it being quite small scale is how it fit into the correct continuity of where the character was at that time, being yeah. in North Norfolk Digital, sidekick Simon being a reasonably major part of it because Tim Key is brilliant. It's just yeah. <laughs> yeah. his feckless sidekick. And even more so going forwards to this time, uh, trying to play with that interactive screen in the first episode of that is just yeah. incredible. <laughs> but he does some dramatic stuff in this as well because he goes through a real trauma, Simon, in, yeah. in this movie. And I think Tim Key plays that brilliantly as well. Yeah. yeah, he does. He's kind of steadily losing patience with Alan and becoming more irritated about this thing on his head and everything and he's, he's he looks terrified all the time by the end he's got a handle on it <laughs> but then then he always remembers his place yeah <laughs> he always remembers his place and he goes back to that kind of sidekick yeah. role yeah, yeah. It's, it just he just breaks for a minute and then yeah. reels it in it's so good it's like looking down at his lap like holding back whatever he was just about to say yeah <laughs> <laughs> I have a bit of trivia. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. 
Go on then. Some alternative titles. Did anybody else hear the alternative titles that they had? Uh, yeah, I think film? around the time it came out, I remember some. Around the time, but I don't remember them now. I'll leave my favourite one till last because there's a few. So there was mm. Norfolk Fracture, which is quite a good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Colossal Velocity. Oh, yeah, Colossal Velocity. I remember that, yeah. That's so good. <laughs> That's, it. That's the one I remember now. That's like 80s action <laughs> film names, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Chap of Steel. <laughs> yeah, I that as well, yeah. Gunbird, which I was like, eh, eh, that's not great. But then my favourite is Hectic Danger Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that one. I thought maybe they could have called it like Siege Face as well or something like that. Because he says that I am Siege Face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's everybody's favourite moments, sequences, etc.? Well, just to kick off, this was one of the most entertaining opening credits I think we've watched <laughs> since this. You know, since we started yeah, the podcast, it's it so good. <laughs> Man, it's that's the way to do opening credits. Is that the bit you meant, or do you mean the Roachwood bit? Because I really like the very opening with the Koyanis Quatsi. I think that's fucking hilarious. And the North Coast, <laughs> all dark and gloomy. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, uh, I mean, when, when we the get the, the, the credits <laughs> with Partridge in the car. Hmm. Right, yeah, that is amazing, yeah. Got your so fog good. lights on. Are your fog yeah, there's no fog. There's no fog. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then straight back into Roachfest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he does it later as well, doesn't he? Is uh, isn't it Paul Young or something? He's doing later. Oh, and he's like when he's doing the um in the the mobile uh, yeah. uh, radio, aren't they? And he's yeah. doing it again. We're not yeah. gonna sit in silence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. One of my favourite bits is when. He tells Lynn that he's feeling a bit crappy about getting Pat sacked, and she suggests that he might feel better if he makes a donation to Sinn Fein. <laughs> yes! I think that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Pat's Irish, right? Yes. <laughs> Why don't you donate fifty pounds to Sinn Fein? Perfect. <laughs> and then looks at himself in the mirror like. <laughs> that's fucking mental. That one. <laughs> See, that's one of that's one of the best lines in it, and it's not even Partridge that says it. It's fucking there. There are so many good lines. There's too many if you start listening through. Yeah. Um, yeah. But speaking of his facial expressions, there was another one that really absolutely killed me, and it's when he's in the back of the police car and he opens the window, and just the look of joy in his face as the window yeah. goes down. <laughs> Gaz mentioned uh, Sean of the Dead earlier, and I remember Gaz went to see a test screen in Sean of the Dead, and uh, they yeah. had the temporary soundtrack on it and the the sequence where they beat the zombie with the pool cues in time to uh don't stop me now by queen and he he said at the time i hope they keep that song in obviously they did and there's a there's a kind of similar moment in alpha papa when uh pat is threatening the hostages to the sound of the theme from ski sunday (laughs) 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 when that came on my wife uh was watching that section with me and we instantly both started singing along to the grandstand <laughs> ski <laughs> theme. Can't help it, can you? <laughs> no. <laughs> the bit I forgot about and then it surprised me and I thought, oh, this is funny, is um, when he's trying to climb back in through the window and he gets his belt caught on the uh, the latch and he has to slide out. <laughs> it's how slowly he falls back out. It's amazing. <laughs> He's, he's got his cock and balls between his legs <laughs> in case he gets papped and then someone's behind him taking photos of him. That's it. Look at me. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very good. Yeah. You mentioned Sean Pertwee before, Craig. Yeah. There's the, the scene where Partridge and uh, Sean Pertwee character are talking before Partridge goes into the siege. It's obviously ad libbed, and it's just so good. It's like two actors really know, like on top of their game. 
Yeah. You can see they're playing off each other and it's just brilliant. It's that bit where he says, uh, it means I'll give you a good hiding. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I love Sean Pertwee. Goddamn national treasure, that guy. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's great. We're talking about other great performances and Tim Key's great performance. And, and one of my favourite sequences is when uh, Phil Cornwell, as Dave Clifton, is talking about his dark times. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> Simon tries to make a joke about what horse is, and uh, yeah. Dave explains to him that it's heroin, and he's like, oh, yeah, I know, I know what horse <laughs> His delivery of that is flawless. <laughs> and F- Phil Cornwell's so great uh, as Dave Clifton. He has to put yeah, a lot he's into fantastic. it. And, uh... He's brilliant. It's great that it's all linked to that first series where Dave is a sort of recovering alcoholic in that series, isn't he? Because Partridge takes yeah. a piss out of him then. Mm. And then obviously we yeah. see him now. It's 16 years later and he's like a proper recovering addict, essentially, isn't he? And he's done all yeah. sorts yeah. of stuff. It's, it's great that they've tied that in and kept him there as well. They must wrestle with that on film spin-offs of TV series. How much do we do this for the fans of the series and how much do we need this to be for a new audience? And I did wonder about the first time Alan mentions our friend Michael. I thought nobody who mm. hasn't watched the series is going to know who Michael is because he doesn't get introduced till a bit later mm. on. But then I thought, you know, fuck those people. You know, <laughs> quite quite rightly, this movie should be for fans. Yeah. Apparently, I was reading he, uh, quite a cult following in the US. So they mm. were confident mm. that they wouldn't just get the UK. And I know I've got a friend from Seattle uh, and he just loves Partridge. Actually, he loves Saxondale even more, but he does. He loves Partridge too. He's called Tex. No, <laughs> he's called Eric. <laughs> Drive a car and it's called Convoy. Put Ginsters <laughs> on the slate. <laughs> Put a Dr. Pepper on the slate. He absolutely loves it. Yeah, he just loves the, the British comedy. But apparently, it's like I say, it's got a, quite a cult following over there as well. You mentioned uh, Mike, Craig. Mm. That was one of my favourite bits. His distraction. <laughs> jumping off <Yeah>. the pier. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Oh, fuck hell. <laughs> you know, at the end, it says that he, he was never seen again. And no. then in, in the book Nomad, uh, Alan mentions it again. He's never been seen. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. He's <laughs> dead. Yeah, the character's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. He you know, doesn't talk about him at all after that. I know. It's gut, it's gut him, really. But I think he's chronically underused in that film because he's in the series and stuff like that. He's just this crazy character. And obviously, he's. I think Partridge must have got him a, a job at the station in security. Presumably. But yeah. he only appears in a couple of points, really, doesn't he? So I wonder if the actor was reluctant, and that's why they, they kind of wrote him out at the end as well. Too busy doing meerkat now, isn't he? I was going to say, why. he's getting sweet meerkat money now, isn't he? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my favourite sequence is uh, very early on uh, when Lynn goes to Alan's home and he's out in his man shed and you can just hear him singing coconut or that coconut uh, yeah. and then <laughs> she goes in and he says oh, I'm just looking up the uh, natural roosting habits of the British Osprey and you can see in his glasses a reflection of a pair of tits yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he looks down and he looks back up and it's changed to an arse <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing they probably couldn't have done on a TV budget at the time. <laughs> Maybe that's where the, the millions went. <laughs> uh, it's just a very simple sight, Doug. Good stuff. Speaking of Lynn, my favourite Lynn moment is her reaction to finding out that she's Alan's next of kin. She's just mm. delighted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest compliment you could Bless pay her. her. Right. She's so sweet, isn't she? Yeah. Politicking Montague yeah. is um is fantastic throughout any of it. Yeah. Oh, amazing. I've listened to like the Oast House one, his podcast, and he's like really the only voice you can hear in it. And when he's talking to Lynn in that, you can just hear what she's like. And they obviously must script what she's saying to him as well. And you never hear any of it, but she's such a fantastic character. And, you know, it wouldn't be the same without her doing Lynn. So, yeah. full, you know, full kudos to her on that. Yeah. I mean, Partridge has quite a few foils. You got. Psychic Simon, Lynn, and Pat in this. And they just all know how to play off him and let him do his thing. It just works so well. They're all so so accomplished, those actors. Re- yeah. Really great. Yeah. I mean, you remember, like, at the time, coming from knowing me, knowing you, to I'm Alan Partridge was a, an incredible difference in, in fleshing out that character in his world. And I think this really adds to that. So yeah. it's successful on that level. They do it every time, don't they? Reinventing him, it's yeah. It, it feels like it's probably unprecedented to have a character reinvented 
within the confines of who he is so many times in terms of the format mm. of the show. Yeah. yeah, he's a unique character in that sense, and it, it always works. A bit of genius in his creation there. I love um, when Alan wants Angela to see that he's on the TV, and he spends it about 40, 45 seconds flicking through TV channels. It's fucking hilarious. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. just sitting there. Slowly just zooming in on his face. He's <laughs> getting <Yeah>. blown. <laughs> <laughs> more and more wide-eyed and slack-jawed. I really love his reaction as well to finding out that Angela has kids and just how he behaves with her for the rest of the, you know, until until after in the end credits, but it's great. There's a line in this that I think explains the rise in popularity of right-wing culture, which is, you make friends with a bully, so they bully someone else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> I do love that Alan gets a chance in this to be heroic in his way by getting Danny to taser Jason. I think that's a real <laughs> hero moment for him. Kind of gives up what could be you know, his comeback and, and does the right thing for once. I think it's a really nice moment for Lynn when Alan asks, what does it profit a man if he gain the world but lose his soul? And she gets to hear him say it. And that's, yeah. that's great. With her fancy hair. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like an explosion. Yeah. <laughs> we, we haven't covered it, but also that faux death scene at the end. Yeah. Yes. Marvellous. Oh, there's some blood running out of my mouth. I'm watching it fly off. That's so good. <laughs> <laughs> so she closes his eyes. I thought he'd killed him off the first time I saw it. I thought so that was it. Yeah. So yeah. did I. <laughs> but it's pitch perfect. It's so good. Yeah. Just one other thing. It could have been a favourite line is when he accidentally describes the decoy dropping off the pizza boxes as a policeman and then tries <laughs> to say that he's a yeah. policeman. <laughs> well, are we ready to move on to favourite lines? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess I just did one. Maybe, Gaz, you could that. say that segues us nicely into favourite lines. Well, Craig has just segued us nicely into favourite lines, so... What you got? In a whiff-free world, what smell would you miss the most? <laughs> Joe, in Holt, my wife's 90. You kinky get? She died. <laughs> Smells <Yeah>. matter. <laughs> <laughs> Smells matter. <laughs> I think that's the cut to the opening credits then, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really early on that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they also say right at the start as they do uh, one that goes, we're going to take in dedications for people who've been wrongly turned down for planning permission. <laughs> <laughs> That's something so partridge to do, isn't it? <laughs> I've got a line from Pat that I really like when he says, you don't think I've got balls? I've got plenty of balls. I've got balls coming out of my ass." <laughs> <laughs> Pat's Irish, isn't he? To be sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the bit where he's, uh, he barges in when they're having their Gordell media meeting. He goes, uh, hi guys, don't mean to be an agenda bender, but is there any chance of a quick... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and then when uh, Jason tries to say the same thing to him later, he goes, you know, yeah. still time for a yeah. quick wah wah. <laughs> he's like, "What? <laughs> oh, you made a different noise." <laughs> that was soft rock cocaine enthusiasts Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cocaine enthusiasts, genius. <laughs> They certainly did do a lot of cocaine. The only line I've got from someone else, actually, is a pat line. He's talking to the owners of Gordale Media. And he says, uh, yeah, I, I Googled you on Yahoo. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite cartridge <laughs> lines is um, just after the hostage situation reveals itself and Partridge is panicking, hiding around a corner in the shaped corridor uh, with the fire extinguisher in his hand hits the first person he comes around the corner he turns out to be sidekick Simon and then he says you step to me (laughs) (laughs) 
and then ask Simon as if he could respond <laughs> whether he should leave him behind. <laughs> just, it just goes anyway. Everybody done with the lines or any more? We could go on forever, can we? Yeah, we could just go through the script. <laughs> like uh, Blomqvist highlighting everything in the case file. Yeah. <laughs> In Alan Partridge, Alpha Papa, old-timey folk DJ Pat Farrell is dismissed by the new owners of local radio station North Norfolk Digital when they are rebranding for a younger demographic as Shape. As such, there's no place for poor old Pat, but he's determined to keep his show on the airwaves. Taking several members of staff, including sidekick Simon, as hostages as he goes live, rogue and off the hook with gentle guitar, strumming and flute-based tunes. But when a partridge is set amongst the pigeons, when the titular Alpha Papa is sent in as a hostage negotiator, eventually forcing Pat to take his show on the road via van in a madcap scheme, really doesn't show him in the best light. What did everybody think of Pat's scheme? Well, he's clearly lost his marbles, hasn't he? He doesn't really have a plan, does he? He has a gun. No. That's what he has. <laughs> it's Alan that has the plan, really, mm. you know, to get on the bus and everything. If Alan wasn't there, I think Pat probably would have just killed some people. Mm. <laughs> yeah, they were the actions of a, a desperate man. Right. And that's why he scores three desperate Florence of Broccoli. Oh. He's pretty generous, really, I think. Mm. Well, you know, he scared a few people. Mm. I think his scheme can be summed up by the fact that when he decides this is the end on the pier i'm just going to i'm going to shoot myself and then he can't even reach the trigger on the gun himself and he gives yeah. the gun to Alan. <laughs> right yeah. will you do it for me of course i will mate <laughs> also his his idea of the head holster he just leaves the shotgun facing you know trigger away from where he is right by the door anyone could come in and get it yeah mm. it's a terrible plan <laughs> This is the part of the show where the panel of peril compete for the title of this week's Most Diabolical. And with that comes the reward of two points, now admittedly worthless, mind you, on our season two (laughs) leaderboard. Although I as host will only gain one point should I win as I chose the film. How can we possibly improve upon Pat Farrell's scheme is my question. Let's do the... Craig, you didn't make that quiet on the last one. Make sure you put the volume down because it's fucking horrible. It's really going to hurt people's ears, that. All right. Well, as a season two finale treat, we're going to break with tradition and we're going to have Craig's plan first. Mm. All right. Pandering to him, aren't you? Pandering to the champion. (laughs) <laughs> Pat Farrell has heard the rumour that Gordale Media is set to mount a hostile takeover at North Norfolk Digital that could jeopardise the careers of several stalwarts of chat radio. His first instinct is to inform his friend, colleague and occasional mint writer co-eater Alan Partridge. However, when Cucumber Cool Alan nonchalantly dismisses the threat, Pat realises that he needs to voice his concerns directly. However, oh no, I've, I've already used however... Maybe, on the other hand? No, that sounds clunky. Aha, got it. But (laughs) what he finds in the conference room gives him pause. A document highlighted in angry red Pentel N50 permanent marker ink. And what is highlighted in that red waterproof ink is two names, which are circled, and the word or, and some arrows. And what is written between those circular, curved, and chevron-shaped lines is a crystal clear message. It's pat or Alan. And they aren't trying to decide which one will get the breakfast slot. They're deciding which one will get the sack. (laughs) Pat feels bad, but he knows he needs to act. He's read Alan's book, Bouncing Back, which you can still find in the works and some branches of British Heart Foundation if you look. (laughs) So he knows exactly which buttons to push and which buttons Alan will push and who Alan will likely finger as the button pusher. Sneaking into Alan's recording booth before he arrives for his show, Pat leaves several Toblerones around Alan's workspace. He replaces all of the music in Alan's playlist with recordings of car wash sounds, and he replaces Alan's usual Java with weak decaf, a perfect storm, sure to cause Alan to go mental and very likely blame serial troublemaker sidekick Simon. 
lambasting the jocular jockey live on air and leaving Gordale with no option but to sack Alan. With Partridge out of the way, Pat is the easiest option to fill in on short notice. But why stop there? He hasn't. Pat's been busy taking out the competition. He's popped into Dave Clifton's booth too and left him some Captain Jack, Smack, (laughs) Skag, Gear or Gordon Brown. Street names for the illegal opioid heroin, Clifton's dark brown mistress. <laughs> Pat's also dropped by the breakfast show booth, leaving a handwritten note from a young lady claiming to be a conquest, revealing that her father is a beloved 70s TV sitcom racist stooge, and that she thinks it would be hilarious if young Danny Sinclair telephoned her father live on air to tell him he shagged his daughter. An irresistible offer for the shock jock. <laughs> Pat also knows the weaknesses of all the other DJs at the station and exploits them accordingly, but as these details are not disclosed in the film, I will not be speculating on them. (laughs) Needless to say, Pat had the last laugh. Would it not arouse suspicion that everybody is coming a cropper to scandals and uh, falling from grace in some way, shape or form, apart from Pat Farrell? Would that not point a finger of suspicion at him? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Look how nonchalant he is. He's already won. He doesn't give a shit. Look at him. I suppose it would in a way. He's taunting us, guys. He's taunting us. That's the response of a man <laughs> with an unassailable lead. <laughs> uh. Um. Yeah. I guess I could. I probably should have said that he leaves alone the other three DJs who we don't know anything about. But, uh, yeah, I thought you'd ask me the opposite thing. What about those other three DJs? <laughs> Second guess myself. But Pat Farrell is so dull and boring and safe pair of hands, he might not be suspected at all. I'd be like, what? who's it going to be? The dull, boring mm. DJ, Pat Farrell. Yeah. And, you know, the idea to discredit Danny Sinclair, do you remember what happened when... Uh, what's his face? Yeah, that was based on uh, the, the the idiot the with the long, comedian. yeah, Russell Brand and Russell uh, Brand, yeah, exactly, and Jonathan Ross, yeah. Do you know what happened to his career after that? He's now shut up. <laughs> yeah, but he had to get out of the radio station he was at. Is was the point, and go to a different one, right? So yeah, Pat doesn't yeah. care. I wonder if, if I, I I think Gordale would would embrace it potentially. I think they'd they'd get the, the ratings. But could Gordale you know. keep Danny? That's the difference. If he's getting offers from yeah. XFM, mm-hmm. you know, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And also look at Russell Brand now, right wing crank doling out shit advice online. Right wing. I thought he was more to left to centre now. Not these days. From, from I, what I've days. heard, I've got some uh, left wing friends that listen to him. Well, those people are crackpots. <laughs> Can you just pass that on for him? <laughs> Let, the, Let the nailed on socialists that I know that they're right wing crackpots. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Next, let's have the person who's abdicating the throne at the end of this episode, Lord mm. Manly Supreme. He's not abdicating, is he? He's not abdicating. He's been forcibly removed. Yeah, if he'd ejected. Yeah, it's more of a coup than anything. Kicking yeah. and screaming. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going quietly into the night, my friend. You have selected regicide. If you know the name of the king or queen being murdered. <laughs> An old-fashioned DJ called Pat, I am. To save my job, I'll be needing a plan. So I think on the sofa. I think in my bed. I think on the loo with a scratch of my head. Gordale want trendy. They want in with the new. They're looking for an audience with a much younger skew. But what these days do young hip kids dig? Aside from MySpace and designer bongs, that is. (laughs) Aha! I cry. There's one thing I know. The kids of 2013 love a reality show. After a jig to celebrate with a jolt and a jerk, I sit at my desk and set straight to work. With colourful markers, I map out my idea and sprinkle on glitter to make it all clear. Then I head to the boardroom for a big old powwow. We can ring in the changes, I say, and I know just how. A contest between presenters, live and on air, 
with challenges designed to shock, awe and scare. A mustard-eating contest with Coleman's best source. Opportunities for lucrative product placement will be par for the course. Trapped in a box with skunks that whiff. And a cook-off hosted by Delia Smith. Quick draw at high noon with pies hotter than the sun. Or in a city sumo. Now that could be fun. (laughs) After six weeks of challenges, the audience get their say, deciding which presenter must be on their way. Against runts like Danny Sinclair and sad Wally Banter, a tough old boot like me would win at a canter. Should I lose, however, there's no need to grieve. After all, Gordair would never allow the creative genius behind I'm a disc jockey, keep me in here to leave. (laughs) Very nice. I sensed quite early on that you were going to do some rhymes there. Remember you when you thought mm-hmm. I was doing rhymes in Dragon Tattoo? Yeah. You could see the cogs turning. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You inspired me. Nice. So you basically tried to um, con us all with a non-musical song because you know if you'd put music to that, <laughs> we would have absolutely called you out on it. But you're thinking... Because... It's a poem. Yeah. That's, it's, it's a song with no music. <laughs> what I would say is, to be fair, unlike the songs... This plan had some substance, so he didn't need to disguise the lack yeah. of a plan with the uh, razzle dazzle this time. Mm. I'm kidding. Your plan for Fair Labyrinth was very good as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think this is a pretty solid plan. You get the confluence of razzle dazzle and content. That's where it's the sweet spot. Yeah, sizzle and steak. How quickly is Pat conceiving, pitching, and getting this reality show commissioned? Oh, because he gets his cards handed to him pretty much instantly, doesn't he? <laughs> This is where, as soon as he he thinks, you know, he has a conversation with Alan, he thinks something's up and he asks Alan to go into the boardroom. Instead of asking Alan to go into the boardroom for him on his behalf, he thinks and he comes up with the idea and then he goes and pitches it. Okay, That's kind of how I did mine as well, isn't it? Because he's at the station at the start and Pat tells him Gordale's there, he says so. And then it's the next day when Pat gets sucked. Mm -hmm. So it gives him a day to do something. Presumably the takeover must have been coming for a while though and it's just when they come over and actually start the takeover yeah but they still haven't decided between pat and alan mm. until they actually get there and do that that, that meeting isn't it yeah yeah so gordale are acting as the production company tv production company in this case for i'm a dj keep me in here well so it could be done on radio is mm. fine and mm. they could broadcast it online as well uh, was what i was thinking they probably got a you know the, the internet you know, you know what they do with the internet these days. Oh, these radio shows all sorts, don't they? usually broadcast. Oh, this this mustard's hot. <laughs> really gets up your Nonsense. nose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it would cause a bit of a stir around Norwich. People would be tuning in, and they'd go, "Oh, have you, have you heard this this crazy contest that's going on?" And you know, the listenership would increase. And so, even if Pat didn't win, Gordale would go, "You came up with a bloody good idea there. We're keeping you on, Pat. We're bloody keeping you on." <laughs> Uh, yeah. Mm. Three words. Water tight. <laughs> <laughs> then we shall move on to Adam's plan, please. Pat Farrell has fallen victim to the hipster brigade. We've seen it recently on Radio 2. All the older generation DJs have been muscled out by younger ex-Radio 1 presenters trying to justify their own existence. Yes, There are other radio stations, but that's not the point. They are part of the furniture, and lots of people like them where they are. Pat knows he has more to give, that he isn't some old has-been, and wants to leave on his own terms when he is ready to do so. So how does he convince Gordale Media he's still got what it takes? Pat knows that Gordale looking at the figures and he might be the weak link. He might be the weak link. It's a doggy dog world out there, Pat. But do you want to be a Pomeranian or a pit bull? He pitches the idea of getting the mobile broadcast fan out of the garage and taking it on the road for a special week of shows. He's going to become a bit of a daredevil, wacky challenges kind of chap. <laughs> Pat has always been a bit of a maverick. No, not driving down the motorway at 80 miles an hour to get somewhere quickly. He's been drawn to things that are dangerous, like owning a shotgun, which he keeps above the mantelpiece. First of all, he takes part in a broadcast from Norwich City Airport 
where he takes part in a charity skydive with pop duo Fats and Small to raise money for a deaf school near to where he lives. <laughs> then he tackles 24 hours on the roller coaster at Great Yarmouth Pleasure Beach with Blazing Squad to help restore a Roban Forter of Victorian folly. Later, handing over a big check to Baldrick from Time Team. Pat also thinks he has the guts to take on Norfolk's competitive eaters and enters an eating competition in association with Thetford Forest Food Bank. <laughs> <laughs> these, these events, and others like it, could be spread out for however long you want. All these fundraising events attract the attention of the press and raise the profile of Pat and North Norfolk Digital before Gordale complete their takeover. This time, when Gordale have their meeting and examine how the station's doing and how its presenters are, Pat will be at the front of their mind for all the right reasons. And uh, that's the end of my plan, but I have come up with some other program types and charity events if you want to hear them as well. Just to, just yeah. Yes, please. Good for it. Rabbit with Dave from Chaz and Dave. <laughs> Pat goes on a rabbit shoot and country ramble with Dave from the aforementioned group, sponsored by the Countryside Alliance. <laughs> Liberty X marks the spot. Pat goes treasure hunting with the forgettably early Naughty's Pop Ensemble. <laughs> Say cheese with Carol Smiley. Pat and ex-changing rooms host Carol visit a Norfolk cheese producer and have to guess what cheese they're smelling while blindfolded. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, last but not least, uh, Bash the Fash Fash. Pat and excitable (laughs) gladiators host John Fashnu take on the far right by defecating on famous national (laughs) monuments and goading racists and knuckle-dragging morons to do something about it. (laughs) How how did you leave them out of the main thing? (laughs) They are all my own creation as well. I haven't stolen them from anywhere. I promise. Hand on my own. Liberty X marks the spot as my favourite. I didn't say cheese is my favourite. (laughs) <laughs> I just it's literally I channeled my inner Alan and I just came up with titles yeah. and and celebrities and I thought what can I fucking do and that was it nailed it and associations as well that that would be uh, <laughs> sponsoring them yeah yeah the uh, food mm. bank for the um for the eating contest I thought was quite good mm. oh, I'd hate to follow that guys really mm. only note was aren't all Radio Two DJs former Radio One DJs. That's like their um, retirement home, isn't I it? I don't know. I don't think Ken Bruce ever was. It's yeah, like an elephant not. graveyard. No, I don't <laughs> think. Hosts. I think Ken Bruce joined Radio Two from somewhere else in like the eighties, and then he's been there ever since. And now mm. they've unceremoniously Radio Scotland dumped him with uh, Ken Bruce. <laughs> Rob Bryden's impression of Ken Bruce is fantastic. He did a April Fool's Day, and he did the whole whole show as Ken Bruce. Yeah, <laughs> it was so good. Wow, well. that was amazing. <laughs> My only problem with your plan, yeah. it was it was all perfect. And oh. then you said he did this all before the takeover. Yeah. That was, that was a shame. That was a shame. I think if he'd have pitched it to the new owners, maybe. But did he have the time to get this done before? Yeah, we t- he did it over a week, the first three. And then I just chucked in at the end of it, I chucked in the extra shows. So he could he could have plotted out more. So when they come, you'd be like, I've, I've done all this shit. Look at all the money I've raised. and Raised the profile of the, of the station. And now I've got all this other stuff planned with uh, John Fashnu and uh, Carol Smiley and stuff. So he, he saw the whole thing coming, basically. He knew there was going to be a takeover. Got ahead of it. He was aware that perhaps his show is probably the most stuffy or out of date of the lot. And um, he thought, well, do I either stay doing what I'm doing worried about everything or do I actually be proactive and try and make things better for myself so he did all right no further questions pat 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 his name is pat pat farrell pat oh pat 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 Pat, Pat. Pat. <laughs> oh, bloody ruddy Pat. Pat. 
Oh, here he goes, here he goes. Pat, 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 pat. My very own pat, pat. <laughs> pat. And so, in summation, Pat should be shown. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Pat should keep his show on the air by just thinking ahead a bit. First, after the bit where Alan says, so, there has to be a small outlay of capital, and he needs to head down to Lowestoft's branch of Millets, just a few miles from Norwich <laughs> City Centre. They are seriously a super outdoors company that can cater to your every need, whether that be rambling, <laughs> kayaking, or even caravanning. But in this instance... All that Pat needs is a one-man tent, retailing from as low as £49, a sleeping bag as low as £13, and some Lynx Java, the price of which sits at a staggering £4.87 in my local convenience store. Daylight robbery, it really is. Jesus. (laughs) Next, Pat should drive to local museum Norwich Castle. I know it sounds mad, a museum that's a castle. I can assure you that it isn't just some balmy, woke nonsense dreamt up by lefty liberal lawyer Gary Lenikers. It's a museum that happens to be sited within the grounds of a castle. It's really quite simple when you think about it. Uh, where was I? Did, did I mention that Pat has to erect his one-man tent out of sight in the ample surrounding area? Oh, I didn't. Okay, well, Pat has to erect his one-man tent out of sight in the ample surrounding area and slither into his sleeping bag once he's ensconced within said tent. Incidentally, he needn't go for the most frugal options that I mentioned earlier. I was just providing starting price points for millets as they sell such quality products at low, low prices. Go as high as you want. (laughs) You will be keeping your job come the end of this, Pat, so money is of no real object. Once night has fallen, Pat should sneak inside the museum castle using the can of Java to spray and find those red laser lines that all museums have that trigger the alarm. (laughs) Then he must make a beeline for the armament swing. Once there, and he's really got to get his skates on because there's next to no chance that some sort of an alarm hasn't been triggered in all fairness. Once there, he should quickly stand next to each suit of armour. I believe there's ten to find the closest fit. One? No, that's too short. Two? That one's too tall. Won't be able to see out of the helmet. Three. Oh, that's a bit too thin. Four. Shaped like an onion. That's a bit weird. Five. Do you know what? Maybe. Maybe. Six. Uh, it's a bit too wee. Seven. <laughs> too hench. Eight. <laughs> too flipping thin again. Nine, two, look, we haven't got time for this. We've got to be quick because, as I say, an alarm has been triggered. Suit of armor number five, it is. <laughs> Out Pat would drag his quarry back to the tent to wait the safety of morning and for the Rosas to leave after investigating all those alarms that just got triggered. Now, if there's anything that I know about suits of armor, it's that they act very much like a suit of armor. And so if our Pat Pat <laughs> were to rock up at shape wearing one, then he would be immune to sacking, threats of physical violence, and possibly even (laughs) name-calling thanks to this miracle of medieval engineering. Actually, he could probably stock up on some tin goods to take in with him, perhaps some adult nappies, and he could just live in his booth in his suit of armour, broadcasting to his heart's content. Who's going to stop him? He's got a suit of armour for Pete's sake. (laughs) And there we have it. (laughs) Suit of armour. (laughs) <laughs> suit of armor. So, how how does the suit of armor prevent him? You know, say if somebody came in and like backed up a recovery truck to the main entrance, and then they pulled the wire in and clipped it onto the back of his suit of armor and just towed him out. <laughs> uh, I, I think that they made metal better in those days, so he would essentially be immovable. It'd be far too heavy for any vehicle to drag but, be it but he can uh, but he can operate vehicle, under his own power jumbo jet or uh milk float <laughs> <laughs> what about if pat mustard came Ooh, that might be a bit trickier he'd whack him with his massive tool and and seduced seduced him <laughs> to get him to come outside with like oh i've got a bottle of milk here for your love 
So my first comment is, I can't believe you stole my Mary joke and then just run it into the ground. <laughs> it was originally a lot longer. <laughs> that back but you pro- yeah, I was I was going to say I bet you you would you wouldn't be able to finish it otherwise because you started giggling quite a lot then. So <laughs> I did quite like the image of Pat as some kind of Goldilocks of armor selection. <laughs> that was nice. My biggest issue with this, though, however, is as you know from making this podcast, mics are very sensitive. They pick up a lot of noise. <sighs> Damn. Imagine him rattling around in that suit of armour. He's not going to keep any listeners. Mm. Well, I haven't scientifically tested it (laughs) or Googled it, but perhaps he might be able to purchase a can of WD-40. I don't know whether that would do the trick with the suit of armour. There's no scientific (laughs) evidence to support that, but it's a fact. Yeah, (laughs) works for me. I think I'm going to leave to Gaz's defence here, because wasn't Jimmy Savile... A, a radio DJ, and didn't he wear a huge wreath of gold chains around oh, his yeah. neck? Yeah, I guess he did. And, and Chelsea, yeah, Chelsea. Yeah. That's why he was always rustling, yeah. causing yeah. static electricity <laughs> everywhere he went. So I think mics must be able to filter out that kind of noise. Mm. I think it's a bit disappointing that once again, Craig, your mind has gone straight to Jimmy Savile. <laughs> yeah, the amount of times I've had to edit out your comments on Jimmy Savile. <laughs> well. You know, it's topical this week, isn't it? Because Coogan's <laughs> playing Jimmy Savile. So. Yeah. 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 But I think metal would be would be far too rattly. Personally. Rattle, rattle. Um, jewelry, rattly, jewelry. rattle. Jingle, jangle. <laughs> yeah, apart from that, Gaz, I thought your plan was shit. So. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, I had a hard time following it. I, I think Gaz has been sponsored by Millet, so yeah. that's that's not helped it. What's not to get? He camps, <laughs> he sneaks in at night, he gets a suit of armour, and then he just sits in his office in a suit of armour. <laughs> That's it. Could could the... Okay. <laughs> Couldn't be simpler. Couldn't be simpler. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what? Some absolutely diabolical schemes there. We had Craig's plan. What did he do? Oh, he uh, Pat purchased the copy of Bouncing Back and drove Alan mad by um, placing Toblerones about the place and so forth until he could fill in for Alan on his shift. And then he also uh, put heroin in Dave Clifton's booth. He didn't buy Bouncing Back. It was a gift from Alan. Slightly dog-eared cover. Some superficial damage. <laughs> superficial yeah, damage. Superficial damage. Yeah. <laughs> They're all damaged. <laughs> Lord Manly Supreme's plan, which had Pat coming up with his own reality show, I'm a DJ, keep me in here, which made him a valuable commodity to Gordale. Adam's plan, which um, had Pat become a travelling daredevil slash challenge chap with lots of celebrity pun-themed shows and skits. (laughs) And my plan, which had Pat... Getting a suit of armour. So, <laughs> if we could all... <laughs> Bonkers when you think of it, isn't it? <laughs> so, if we could all cast our votes, but not for yourselves, for goodness sake, you bunch of cards, yeah. First up, shall we see who Craig voted for? Unsurprisingly, one of us had a... I think a, a big advantage here and uh, excelled and that, that person was Adam Partridge. <laughs> <laughs> Butter my arse. Lord Manly Supreme. I'd have to agree with Craig wholeheartedly. <laughs> and, uh, my vote is also for Adam Partridge. Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> and I also cast my vote for Adam Shartridge. It's a uh, landslide. <laughs> <laughs> and I also voted for myself. No, I haven't uh, voted for Lord Manly Supreme. Oh, he's got a pity vote at the yeah. end there. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> Excellent. And with that, we have the final scores for season two. As we all know, Craig has won as he is in top spot with 13 and a half points. In second place is myself with eight and a half points. 
In third place with seven and a half points is Lord Manly Supreme. And in last place with six and a half points is Adam. So it's very, very close, apart from Craig, who ran away with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of repeat of last season, really, I suppose, apart from it came down to the wire, because all four of us could have won it at the last, last episode. <laughs> really. so, so it's like nothing like last series. Nothing like <laughs> <laughs> I was so confused there. I'm glad you came to that realisation. <laughs> well, it's been a hell of a season, boys. Yeah. Yeah. So Very long. Good Another great one. Yeah. Craig, I'm just metaphorically and physically handing you my crown. Thank you. Over the airwaves. I, I bet Craig's artwork is going to get done a lot faster than yours was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fucking massive crown. It's well, I've already drawn there. the crown now, is so I, I can just transfer it. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> but yeah, for uh, for the duration of season three, you can now call me Count Attacular. Count Attacular. <laughs> Count Attacular. That's my name. Okay. <laughs> There's a theme being established here. I almost went with Count Fuckular. But then I, no. I remembered that it's a character from Extras. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And that about does it for season two. But we shall return for season three next week, which will be another 20 episode run and with a whiz bang new scoring system. Adam will have the honour of hosting the podcast next week with his choice of film. So, what's that going to be, Adam? Well, we are going to stick with British cinema. We are going to go to horror. We are talking teeth. We are talking claws. We are talking full moons. We shall be talking dog soldiers. Ah, very good. Very good. I haven't seen that in many a, many a moon. Mm. Eh? Mm-hmm. Oh, eh? oh, oh, I don't think I've ever seen it. But that's a, that's a, it's another Sean Pertwee film. It Sean is Pertwee, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. If you like what you hear each week, please subscribe, leave us a five-star review and follow us on Apple Podcasts if you're on there. We recently saw quite a big boost on Apple, so please help to keep that going as your reviews push the podcast visibility in their algorithm. Remember to tell your friends in person and on social media about Diabolical. Word of mouth is still the best tool that we have, so please do pass us along. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at DiabolicalPod. And next week, we'll be back with the first episode of Season 3 to discuss dog souls. And we hope that you'll be here with us soon. Until then, remember, everything will be alright in the end. And if it isn't alright, then it isn't the end. Aha! In uh, in honour of uh, tonight's uh, film choice i am wearing my cock piss partridge t-shirt <laughs> nice <laughs> do you remember turner when spider-man 3 came out available for home video release and i pre-ordered the dvd and the pre-order incentive was you could get your own bespoke spider-man 3 poster with whatever mm-hmm. wording you wanted on it but in the sony font and my poster said <laughs> cock piss spider-man <laughs> Did mine say? Uh, you said the, the Godfather <laughs> 3 of Spider Man movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's very good, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please subscribe. Lisa. Hmm? Lisa Tarbuck. <laughs> <laughs> Played by the wonderful Cole Meany, DJ Pat Farrell sets the plot in motion when he sets. Oh. I've written, sets the plot in motion when he sets the plot in motion. (laughs) I mean, it's factual. Let's do the mind walk again. Your brain brain and hands weren't communicating. (laughs) Played by the wonderful Cole Meany, DJ Pat Farrell sets the plot in motion by starting a hostage situation at the now smile. Ah, Shape, isn't it? Yeah. Fuck. I kept on writing smile yeah, down. Yeah. I thought I'd uh I thought I'd eliminate it. Just have it the that. way you want it. <laughs> <laughs> the way you want it to be. <laughs> well, you're well remembered, yeah. Yeah, that was yeah, that was a, that was a yeah.